So my name is John Bandler. Welcome to the workshop, the 2020 workshop, which hopefully will prepare some of you for the uh, McMaster University three-minute thesis competition that's coming up in, in March. Uh, and of course, there are all kinds of other competitions that are going on, including quite, quite a few in the Faculty of Engineering and in my own Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering, too. Again, by way of introducing one of our co-presenters, Michelle Grodnik, I'll just play this video for you. I can't help it. I'm constantly thinking about checking my phone. Come on, you've been there. Imagine, struggling to focus, maybe even on this presentation, and a thought like checking your social media keeps stealing your attention. That's mind wandering. And if you find your mind wanders, you're definitely not the only one. In fact, university students can spend 30 to 40% of class time off task, seriously impairing their learning. Clearly, we need some sort of strategy to help students stay on task. And our team's answer, exercise. Exercise can sharpen your attention, improve your memory, and boost your capacity to learn. In McMaster University's NeuroFit Lab, we're investigating how we can incorporate exercise breaks into a university classroom. Our preliminary findings show that students who take three five-minute exercise breaks during an online lecture are able to sustain their focus until the end. However, those who take computer game breaks or no breaks lose focus near the end. This increased focus for our exercisers translated to higher academic performance, both immediately after learning and two days later. Clearly, there's something special about exercise, but could it be the difference between a B and an A? Well, there's still work to be done. What our lab wants to know is one, how intense do these exercise breaks need to be to show academic improvement? Two, how many breaks are required to show a real learning benefit? And three, how does this translate to different learning environments? Answering these questions while incorporating student and teacher feedback will allow us to create refined, feasible exercise prescriptions for teachers, students, and universities. What I can tell you right now is this. In order to reduce the time spent distracted in class and improve academic success, students should sweat so they don't forget. Michelle, why don't you come up and uh, say a few words? Um, you want to kick the ball? Yeah, um, I'm really sorry. That's what I normally sound like right now, going through a bit of a, a cold, so forgive me. Um, yeah, so my name is Michelle. I'm a PhD student in the Department of Kinesiology. That was my Shirk Storytellers video. So during the 2018-2019 year, um, essentially it's a five minute competition that you can submit your knowledge translation piece to. And so there's a video component and an oral component, super fun. Um, and I got into this stuff by kind of segue of doing a 3MT first. Um, so I'm looking forward to chatting with you all about this today. But before we get into conversations, I think um, it's really important not only to acknowledge, but really think about the fact that we are on the traditional lands of the Haudenosaunee and Mississauga peoples, and the land is protected by what's called the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Agreement. Have folks heard of that before? Essentially, what I think is important to acknowledge is that we don't want to just acknowledge these things, we want to actually take them into our our work and what we do. And so um, one of the things that folks who um, we collaborate with talk about all the time is the importance of storytelling. And so I think reflecting and incorporating and considering the importance of communicating our work beyond just the ivory towers of academia and into the real world is, a, is a, something we can reflect on. Um, but moving forward, I'm really stoked. Erica, who we'll introduce shortly, uh, recently participated in the 3MT competition was outstanding, and so I feel like her going through her presentation, we're all gonna learn a lot today. Um, but yeah, I'll pop in here and there, but for the most part, if you have questions, we're happy to chat as we go through. If you wanna put your hands up, this is meant to be more conversational style versus like, we speak and you listen. Hey, Cindy. Um, so yeah, feel free. Okay. Thanks, Michelle. 
Um, that was in that came in in the top five Canada wide, right? In that competition, yeah, that's pretty good, right? Yeah. Anyway, you got applause. That's fantastic. <laughs> that's great. So um, before sort of officially unveiling the uh, the workshop. Let me start off with uh, this particular slide. Flattery and praise are as lethal as sugar. And that's a theme that you'll see repeated a few times. Uh, you're preparing a paper, a speech, a presentation, and you, you unveil it on your friends, and your friends kind of say, oh yeah, this is great, wonderful. Uh, they don't critique you, they, they're afraid of doing it, they don't want to hurt your feelings. So, as I say, this is a useful, um, piece of information. So don't feel bad if you're not praised. Beware of experts, teachers, gurus, and peers, and we're presenting ourselves, uh, Erica, Michelle, and myself, I guess we're presenting ourselves as gurus, and we have a couple of guests here as well, Matthew Berry and Julian Yabot, uh, uh, who will speak a little bit later on when you've been warmed up appropriately and can, uh, you know, hold their feet to the fire. So anyway, they will also be experts, teachers, gurus, and peers, and of course, who be, beware of them, if they, particularly if they cheat you with false praise. False praise is the easiest thing to get somebody out of your office. Somebody asks you a question, how was I, how was it? Great, wonderful, great, that's it, nothing. And, and you sort of feel, you, you, you only get a sugar high for a spike for a little moment. You go out, five minutes later, you say, well, why was it good? What was good about it? Okay, so that's a thing to be careful of. Authentic, engaging, clear, your thesis in three short minutes. I'm John Bandler. You've just seen Michelle O'Grodnick come here. Erica, Erica, come over here. Over here, so to uh, present yourself to the camera here. And, and it, it looks like we have a, a little well, I don't know what this is. It's not, it's not quite a parallelogram. It's not quite square, but it seems to be... Oh, I'm supposed to stand over here. Am I, uh, Greg? Right? Really? Because you're using manual focus and you're too lazy to adjust, make adjustments. Okay? No. Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wander all over the place. I'm going to be in front of this picture so that your focus will go... Your autofocus will go to that picture. Right? Okay. Uh, the, the moral of that is, in any presentation that might be videoed, like Three Minute Thesis Competition, a trusty videographer will probably put an X rather than a square on, on the floor and say, stand there. And of course, if you stand there, it really doesn't look very good. You, you, you have to ignore what videographers tell you to do. Okay, that's the three of us. I have a lot of acknowledgments, as, as always. Erin um, Kiley, for example, is someone I've worked with now for the fourth time on a major IEEE uh, conference. We, we, we have co-organized a three-minute thesis uh, competition at this IEEE conference. It's in Los Angeles this year, and there are hundreds of potential <laughs> candidates, and we have to you know, work our way through them. So that's Erin Kiley. She's a mathematician who's at the um, uh, Massachusetts College of Liberal Arts. Uh, Anna Kovacevic, who's done this uh, style workshop with me in 2016. Uh, we, have a video, we have videos online, by the way, that uh, you can uh, watch those earlier presentations. And Daniel Tajik, who did this with us a couple, a couple of years running. And John Vlacopoulos, my good friend over there from Chemical Engineering, with whom I off whom I bounce many uh, presentation skill and other other issues. So there's a lot of other people there. You might have noticed your own name there as well. Some of you are named. Okay, our agenda. Um, I will hint at certain problems with technical presentations, particularly because most of them tend to be very boring. Uh, we'll talk about presentation do's and presentation don'ts. Examples, some case studies. We'll cover Erica Dow's 3MT presentation from last year in great detail, and she's, she will do that. I'm looking forward to how that comes out. Um, and Michelle's one-minute speech. Uh, we did her three-minute presentation, I think, last year as well. Uh, yes, I think we did, yeah. We'll talk about slide composition, title formulation. We'll talk about authenticity or appearing authentic versus theatricality. 
Uh, and then we'll talk about some 3MT recollections and experiences, at which point Matthew Berry and Julian will, will both uh, come up here and offer their wisdom, and we'll do some further analysis and discussion. What's not covered is this, this laundry list here, which is not covered, like poster presentations, exhibitor presentations, written presentations, thesis presentations. However, let, let your eyes run down that list. If you have any questions about those things, by all means, throw out, you know, ask. If you have a question that's burning on any of those issues, thesis presentations, thesis defenses, can I use 3MT in my thesis defense? Ask those questions. And don't be shy. So we'll break the ice very soon and get the dialogue going. Okay, I'm going to take the words of the title, authentic, engaging, clear, etc., etc., and I'll cover each of those uh, expressions. Be authentic, which really means to me, be yourself. I mean, Donald Trump is always himself, right? He's totally authentic, and that's why well, that's one problem. Okay, be sincere. You can be, and of course, he's sincere whether he says one thing or the opposite in the same sentence. Be personal, don't act, don't pretend, and kill your fake speech mode. What happens so many times is you ask somebody to, to speak, and suddenly they feel there's a certain sp theatrical speech mode that they have to go into. Now, I hope, I don't know, but I hope my, my speech is fairly normal and not too theatrical. Uh, I don't, do I sound normal? Is, is this how I sound uh, offline? Okay, good, thanks. So kill your fake speech mode. Be engaging, which to me implies uh, to be empathetic, approachable, conversational, conversational in the moment. You're right there in the moment, thinking your way through right there and then. You're not just regurgitating something while you're thinking about something else. And be memorable, of course. How to be clear. One way to be clear is to skip jargon, particularly in a three-minute thesis competition, where you're supposed to be addressing, in my view, literally anybody who walks in the room. So skip jargon, skip mind-twisting logic. These long sentences with umpteen negatives and a negative and another negative. After a while, you use track of all the negatives, but the logic is still there. It doesn't work in a, in a speech. Keep sentences short and punchy. Speak words clean, crisp, clear. Cleanly, crisply, clearly, but I prefer clean, crisp, and clear there. Okay, your thesis is exciting, right? Anybody not excited by their thesis? Is useful, right? Does anybody here think their thesis is not going to be useful? I mean, that's okay. There's a lot of mathematicians and other highly theoretical people that, that turn their noses up at anything that's supposed to be applicable. So, it's, you know, it's applicable? My work is not applicable. Anyway, useful, but maybe just useful to the other specialist. If not, why are you here? Okay. So what I'm trying to imply is that You've got to convey this enthusiasm and this excitement and this utility of your work, the utility of your work to, to the judges in your competition. Three minutes is tough. Trust me, I, I've seen people you know, squeeze a five minute uh, 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 script into three minutes and they go at high speed. So three minutes is tough. Three short minutes is tougher. Three very short minutes is, uh, are truly appreciated. Trust me, judges, if they see someone who's presenting something in a more relaxed, enthusiastic way and finishes well under three minutes, that's fine. Now, I won't play these videos, although I can uh, play them. They're, this is uh, the 2018 workshop that I did with uh, Michelle and Daniel Tajik. Uh, so that's online on my YouTube channel, and this is the last year's uh, presentation that took a few months to uh, get to, uh, let's say, to be processed. Um, I see Greg there behind the camera smiling at this, which is fine. We had a lot of fun doing it, at least getting the job finished together. Okay, how to make your audience want less. And of course, this applies to technical presentations, classes that you go to, where the board starts to fill up with equations and so on. 
crammed with text, small images, dense tables, lengthy equations, detailed flow diagrams, in-your-face logos and all kinds of branding paraphernalia, you know, brighter world and purple and green and yellow and all this stuff is in your face over and over and over again. And too many slides, of course, usually someone flips through quick slides with all this stuff. Imagine slides crammed with tables and equations and, and, and uh, text and erasing through those. That, that to me is a typical technical presentation. And the problem is, for some reason, when you go to a conference, ev almost every technical presentation is boring. And every speaker seems to think, well, that's, th that's what everybody expects. You're supposed to be boring. Because the previous speaker was boring, so I'm going to be boring. So they all copy each other. A typical oral delivery, de delivery is ill-prepared, rushed. The speaker seems distant. I hope I'm not going to be too distant. I'm trying to engage you here. Always runs out of time. Whether speaker is given three minutes, 20 or 50 minutes, and Matthew, you're going to be given 20 seconds to cram. No, just kidding. <laughs> Always, and you'll run out of time, of course. I'll give you 20 seconds. Little or no time for questions. And of course, people are often afraid of uh, having questions asked, so they kind of fill the time up. And when the chair of the session says, oh, I'm sorry, we're out of time, next paper. You breathe a sigh of relief because, oh, thank goodness, I haven't been asked any questions. And often delivered in a monotone, and the speaker swallows words or whispers or something, and you wonder why. First impressions. Are you aware of how you were perceived or received if they don't know you already? Of course, you don't, most of you probably don't know me. I don't know how many know Michelle or how many know Erica. You're going to be getting a certain first impression. And you probably have those first impressions well under your belts already because you've seen us all here in one capacity or another. So how are you perceived? I, don't, I have no idea right now how I'm coming across. I hope it's good. If they've never heard you speak before, if they've never heard of you before, if they've never seen you before, if you don't look them in the eye, or don't appear to be looking them in the eye. Now, I'm look, when I look at each of you, I'm actually kind of going from eye to eye to eye. I'm not looking at the ceiling or at a chair. Or at a, I'm, and of course, that is a little difficult, because I could easily be put off if, if, if you look unhappy or you're sleeping or something like that, right? That, that's, oh my god, that guy's sleeping. I must be boring him. Um, if you're underdressed, I hope I'm not underdressed or overdressed. Uh, if you flash an overloaded or crammed slide at them, if you hide behind the toe podium, let me hide behind the podium and make Greg's life a little bit more miserable as he tries to follow me and use autofocus to uh, hunt for my face. Okay, I'll come back again. I'm hiding behind the podium here. Um, so, how to make your audience want more? and things to consider. And I'm just going to go through a few aspects of this. So let your eyes wander over some of these words. Take them in subliminally if you can. Uh, when you create a speech, try, try to create it in a kind of a story format if you can. <coughs> Remember that there is subtext to every story, which actually is what makes the story live. Uh, it's the subtext that tends to make it live rather than text, so, so that's in your speech and of course it can also be in your actions as well. How is your slide composed? Is it simple? Is it relevant to your presentation and so on? And then of course you, the, the uh, things to consider about yourself. First impressions, theatricality. Am I being too theatrical or not theatrical enough or should I just avoid that uh, all, altogether? How aware are you of how you come across? So, 3MT. Yeah. This is where you come in, Michelle. Yeah. Can I steal that from you, John? Yeah. Oh, no. Thank you, thank you. Okay. Um, how many of you have read the rules of the 3MT so far? Anybody? A couple of people? Okay, important refresher. So you've got three minutes, no more. If you go over, you're considered disqualified, so to keep that in mind. And you only have one static slide the whole time, which I think is quite different than some of the other presentations folks might have done in the room. Um, but what's nice about the 3MT um, 
is that through this process, you can win some money and outside of maybe, maybe I'm just like been a grad student too long and I'm like, ooh, money, this is, this is wicked. Um, I think one of the biggest take homes is that transferable skill, that ability to communicate your work, not just in the ivory towers of academia if you choose to pursue that path, but as you potentially transition to industry or other sectors in academia, this ability to be able to communicate what you're thinking, whether it be a paper that you're reading and it's not your thesis, or a novel finding that your boss wants you to share with a group of stakeholders. I think that this skill is extremely transferable. Um, but do folks have any questions about the actual competition itself or anything in that regard? We're feeling okay? We get the scope? Okay, fabulous. Okay, I think the rest is for you, John, unless you want me to keep going. Okay, um, so in the three minutes, you essentially, for us graduate students in the room, I know there's some undergrads as well, but you are communicating a lot of complex info in a short amount of time. I can promise you that three minutes is more than enough for you to do it. Um, I've done it in one. It wasn't perfect but it was done. And so this idea of a lot of complex material in a short amount of time can be challenging, but your goal is to spark curiosity and make your audience stoked about what you're stoked about, excited about what you're researching, excited about that new paper you found. And so you're communicating this complex info in a way that wants to bring people in. And highlight at the bottom, the cash money in the 3MT specifically, but you know, I think something that I've gained throughout my experience working in science communication and knowledge translation is when I started as a master's student, so I'm in year two of PhD, so I've been a grad student for four years now. And I think when I first started, I was always comfortable giving presentations, but I think now I'm teaching a course sessionally for the first time this term and done some TA work as I'm sure most of you do. And through the experience of presenting under pressure, it's really helped me gain confidence in a lot of other disciplines and spaces and places that I hope you take away as well. Um, feeling good? Feeling great? Making sense so far? Okay, fabulous. So how many here have actually registered for the three minute thesis competition so far? Just raise your hands if you have. One, two, three, Any, anyone else, four, anyone else going to register? Good. Okay, that's great. That's great. So we have, uh, that's great. Well, hopefully we'll convince you that it's worthwhile. Um, <clears throat> so I'll come back to that a little bit later on. Now, you know, every every field has its own jargon and uh, things that you might think everybody should understand. You know, words like model and constraint. You know, words like model and constraint are used differently in different areas. Generally speaking, a scientist or an engineer would, would have a good idea of what's meant in a particular context, but, but um, the, the general public, if you ask what a model or, or a constraint, I, this, it may be so obvious to you, but it may not be obvious to e even very, very intelligent uh, uh, judges. So here's some extreme jargon, uh, multiplexer, um, isotropic, homomorphic. Now here's some words that are misunderstood, that if you, if you pepper your presentation with words like scattering and cardinality and mean and me, median and mean, filter, mass, constraint, it, it might sound very much, you know, it, in, in the public domain, because you see those words used and spoken, but they can be extremely uh, misunderstood. Um, in general usage, you see words like deep learning, cortex, DNA, uh, acronyms, uh, AI, neural network, 5G. Uh, you can throw those things around to some extent because they're in general usage, but then think, are you doing a sales job? Is this a sales job or is this a, a serious presentation? So be careful about that. And if you have any, any examples from your own discipline that I've maybe this, that, that, that this, uh, that this might jog your memory about, that you'd like to ask, ask me, you know, throw out a word, is that easily understood? So why doesn't somebody just throw out any word from their own field that they think the general public should understand? Just one word, any word. <laughs> 
Yeah, you, go ahead, shout it out. EEG? E yeah, EEG, I suppose. Yeah, it, yeah I, you know, if someone has already had an EEG done to them, maybe, um, but... I feel like folks, even when they get it done, they don't know... That's right, exactly, what is it, what is it really, what is it really? Yeah, it's, so if you have to use that, there's no, nothing to stop you from using something like that, a term like this, but then make sure you repeat it, make sure you put it into a certain context. Make sure, for example, that you have to use it, but it's more of a label, don't worry about what it means. So this is, technical people would understand this, don't worry what it means, but it's just a label for a like a name. I mean, what, do, what, does, what does John mean? What does, what does Michelle mean, right? These are just names. So if you kind of embed it in your presentation in that form, you might be able to get away with it. Yeah, yeah, sorry, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, shout it out. Inclusion? Inclusion? Inclusion. Now, as a technical term. Yeah, and in which, which field is, are you talking about? Which field? Metallurgy. Metallurgy, inclusion. Yeah, well, that's right. I mean, that, to me, that would be... If you're thinking of it in a technical sense, that would be extreme jargon. It's a word that, you know, rolls off the tongue easily, but what it means, it's going to be very, be very difficult to understand. Definitely not for 3MT. So, okay, 3MT, no jargon. Don't get stuck in details and weeds. Try to use metaphors, but be careful about metaphors. Metaphors can be taken literally sometimes. And so the metaphor might be, might be taken for a scientific statement. You have to sort of make sure that the metaphor is understood. Include st human stories, include your own story. How did you get into this? Why are you excited about it? Is there a, a person in your family that kind of a, somehow has a certain issue or problem that attracted you to this particular field? Now, you have to memorize your presentation. It's less than three minutes, but you have to memorize it perfectly. And what I always tell peop people is go beyond just simply memorizing it by rote. And when you memorize it, make sure that you, you memorize it not just standing still and sort of going through it very quickly, but memorize it walking the stage or, 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 or go being in a classroom and being able to go far beyond just simply recalling the words because then you'll be searching for that next word constantly. You want to have that at your, uh, totally at your fingertips. You need this. Yeah, go ahead. Um, as someone who normally doesn't memorize things, I just kind of show up and hope what falls out of my mouth is appropriate. Um, this is, when you're under tight timelines, I would highly encourage scripting and knowing your script well as someone who doesn't like to script things. Now naturally, obviously it'll be up to your discretion as to what fits best, um, but at least having some idea of how much time will go to what points, I think will save you from running out of time in the end. I think that's a big one and that's something that, uh, it was a big takeaway for me as someone who normally doesn't script things, so to be clear. Yeah, now, and uh, also say, give the audience uh, tangible takeaways. In other words, if somebody stumbles into the room and you're going through your three minute thesis uh, uh, as a rehearsal or your presentation, and that person just stumbles in and then decides to sit and listen to this and then leaves, and someone asks that person, what was that all about? They, they should be able to give th that person the gist of what they just heard and not say, I didn't understand a word. Okay, more things to consider. Start on your slide early, integrate with your speech. Uh, you have a little anecdote on that, Michelle, starting a slide early here, but come, come here and... Uh, that's okay. Um, what John is referring to is, we're not gonna go through my 3MT, but if you ever go and watch it, first off, sorry about that. Second off, the slide is not super fab. Um, I'm very fortunate my friend Paulina helped me put something together super last minute but as someone who normally feels comfortable and I make kind of my teaching materials and stuff as I go I was like oh yeah I'll come up with something it'll be no problem I'll put together a slide I got this I know my content um, and then when I sat down to think about what I needed to put on this slide to to enhance my presentation uh, about two hours before it was due not so fabulous. And so some of the best 3MTs that I've seen since, and I'm totally cool with acknowledging my 
setbacks and failures and mistakes. Um, some of the best 3MTs that I've seen have been folks who think about their slide and use it as part of their story and it doesn't tell their story for them. It's a, it's a component of their storytelling. So mine was essentially, um, I was talking about exercise, sweating so you don't forget was the catchphrase my friend Kristen Lucibello came up with. Um, but I had this summary of like, here's some sweat pointing to an A, which is fine and it was fine summary, but it didn't by any means enhance my presentation. If I spoke without the slide there, it would have been just as fine. And so I think using the slide to your advantage to create that drama, to be that interesting piece, and Erica's phenomenal, no surprise, and she'll talk a little bit more about that, but don't be like Michelle. Think about your slide in advance. It is important to couple with your script, and that's what I think helps make a, a good 3MT a great 3MT. Cool? Thank you, Michelle. Now, I recommend 120 words per minute as maximum, absolute max. So that means 360 words. If you're going beyond 360 words, you have to be able to speak fast and be still very clear in your speech. I, find, I think 360 is, and again, our guests here can, can contradict me when they have their time on the stage here, or they can contradict me any time, you know, because I can squeeze 500 into it. <laughs> so, so consider a story format. I think that's really, really important, and you'll see that with Erica's presentation. You know, introduce a human being at the beginning if you can. That person sort of acts as a protagonist or and then but make sure you finish on that person as well you start off with uh, once upon a time there was cinderella you want to know what happened to cinderella at the end of the story avoid generalities be specific give specific examples even though, even if you're dying to be general and you're dying to cover every possibility indicate your qualifications and that can be done very subtly just simply saying i'm a phd student uh, that's enough to kind of indicate your qualifications. Rehearse with people who haven't heard you speak before. If you keep rehearsing with people who've already had heard that speech, they will already have tuned themselves to the content, to you, and uh, you, need, you need fresh ears and fresh eyes, if at all possible, as, as often as you can. And don't be satisfied with them being nice to you. And don't look like you're reading a script. So when you're up there, like, like me, don't look like I'm reading a script, okay? And you, you sometimes see that. You can almost see that person looking at the script uh, while they're speaking. Make eye contact. Articulate every single word clearly, including your name. And interestingly and sadly, most people, uh, most people, even professionals, will fumble their own name. They'll slur their name or say it very quickly as if it's not important. And you just keep saying, what did that person just say about their name? Uh, it, it, it's, it's, I don't know why, why, why that is. I, I probably do it myself. Pause, which means stop speaking. Now normally when you're having a conversation with someone and you stop speaking, somebody else jumps in right away. So you keep speaking quickly so that nobody jumps in. You don't want to leave pauses. You want to get your words across. But when you have three minutes, those three minutes are your three minutes. You know, you could go at super slow motion and they won't kick you out. Nobody's going to interrupt you. Yes, shout it out. Of the, yes, yes, good point. Yeah, can you ask questions of the audience? Rhetorical questions. Rhetorical. Uh, you know, it, you're sort of, you're not supposed to interact. You're not supposed to have a real conversation. But if your question is genuinely rhetorical or could be interpreted that, and you can't stop a member of the audience responding, right? So. The floor is yours, however, you will not be interrupted. Uh, nobody will kick you out until the clock hits three minutes. And even then, they won't kick you out. You may go over three minutes. You're disqualified, but they won't stop you from speaking. Now, be in the moment. And what that means is, don't look like you're, don't look like you're reciting a script or a sermon. Look like you're having an actual conversation. And sometimes when I work with uh, students one-on-one, -on -one, and maybe I have two or three that I'm working with, I get them to sit across a table, and I ask each one in turn to deliver their opening lines to the other. And, and I, it, you, you have, it's, it's quite comical, actually, uh, when that happens, sometimes. Anyway, be in the way. you'll recover if things go wrong as long as you know what you're talking about. You may miss a line, you may miss a word, you may miss a phrase. 
Only you know that you've missed anything. Most of the audience, I would say 99% of the audience and the judges won't have any idea. They might have thought, oh, maybe I was asleep at that moment. And they'll, but if you draw attention to it by apologizing, then they'll know that you've done something. So never apologize, just keep on going. Paraphrase, backtrack, repeat what you've just said. If you need to remember something by repeating the previous line, repeat the previous line. It is, no, it is done in normal speech. Sometimes in a regular conversation, you will simply come to a point, then repeat that line and continue, and it sounds quite normal. Anyway, be kind to the judges, be brief, they will thank you. So, in our case studies, we're going to have a couple of videos, uh, and, and one particularly from Erica in a moment. Look for metaphor, look for believability, purposeful gestures, engaging with the slide. You, you want to see, you want to engage with the slide. I'm not doing much engaging with the slide because it's really high, uh, and I'm holding, the, I'm holding two, <laughs> two items that you will not be holding anything when you're doing the uh, presentation. <coughs> Um, engage with the slide, have some dramatic pauses, but make sure if you have a pause, you better deliver on the other end of the pause. A pause is really just as good as what you deliver at the other end of it, something dramatic. Make it relatable to people, have some humor. We can talk about humor later, and I've already covered uh, storytelling. Make sure the audience has something to take away. And with that, Erica, we come to you and uh, over to you, and I think you are miked, so you can just go right ahead. You want to have this? Sure. All right, so my name is Erica. I'm a PhD <coughs> student in the Department of Physics and Astronomy, and I'll be your first case study today. And we'll actually watch my three-minute thesis presentation from last year, and then we'll talk about how I formulated that entire presentation in detail. Maybe too much detail, but I hope it is helpful. Your mother, your grandmother, your aunt, a friend, or maybe even you. We all know somebody that has been affected by breast cancer. But what you might not know is how hard it is to locate a cancerous tumor exactly. With imaging technology, we can find out where the cancer is, and we can also find out where the cancer is not. But what's really hard is to actually find that boundary where cancerous tissue and healthy tissue transition. Where does cancer begin? Is it here? Is it there? Or is it there? This is a real challenge. Surgeons face this every single day. In fact, many breast cancer patients that have their tumor surgically removed have to come back a second time to get what was missed the first time. How can we prevent this? My name is Erica Dow, and my PhD project involves developing a tool that surgeons can use right in the operating room to detect breast cancer. I study how breast tissue behaves when it's stimulated with optical light and x-rays. I look for trends in parameters such as how long do the tissues emit light after being illuminated? Or how does the reflected light disperse in different directions? And what are the tissues made of at an elemental level? I use these patterns to create an algorithm for tissue classification. So how does the device work? Well, it's going to be used when it absolutely matters most during surgery. A surgeon will place this pen-like probe right on top of the breast tissue. It'll emit light and also measure what is emitted or reflected. Within seconds, it will report either cancerous, remove the tissue, or non-cancerous, leave it in place. This device will help surgeons navigate this gray area so that they know exactly how much tissue to remove not too little and risk leaving cancer still in the body, but also not too much and unnecessarily removing completely healthy tissue. My goal is that within the next few years, we will have the technology to keep my loved ones and your loved ones as whole as possible. Thank you.
Thanks, Kay. So that was my presentation that I did in L.R. Wilson Concert Hall, where the big three-minute thesis presentation competition is. And before we actually start dissecting the presentation, we just wanted to ask, what is your takeaway from my presentation? Yeah, what's your takeaway? So any question, any uh, comments from the audience here? What yeah. The best one-liner for me was the last one, the way you ended it. Uh, you want to keep your loved ones whole, as whole as possible. So for me, that was really lit. And you want to repeat that? Right, so uh, the gentleman here says that his main takeaway was that last sentence. That last sentence was my last opportunity to leave an impression. And I said I wanted to keep my loved ones and your loved ones as whole as possible. Thanks. Any more comments? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so re re repeat, repeat. So the comment here was that my slide was very simple and I also interacted with it a lot. So throughout the entire presentation, it wasn't just a backdrop, I was actually utilizing it and pointing to different areas of the slide. So on that note, let's talk about the slide. So as previously mentioned by Michelle and John, what's really common is that someone has a concept for their speech and then right before the due date of the slide, they come up with a slide. And even as an audience member, when you're watching, you probably know who those people are. You go, oh yeah, it's kind of related, but it's mostly just a backdrop, um, not much going there. So when I did my presentation, I wanted to be dramatic. When we talked about first impressions, you might think that how you look or your first sentence or two is your first impression, it's actually your slide. So before you even start speaking, as you're walking up, they'll announce your name and then put up your slide. So I thought, okay, how can I make a huge impact right at the beginning? Why don't I create a slide with tons of mystery? When you first look at this slide, it's just a white gradient to black. It looks very, very plain. It looks like there's a header and a footer, but there's not actually much in the middle. One of my friends that came to watch the presentation actually told me that when they put up my slide, he actually went, oh my gosh, did something go wrong? Like, was there supposed to be a picture there? And then they just forgot it. Or like, you know, the PowerPoint didn't export properly. Like, something must have happened, right? Um, but as I continued on to the speech and I explained why it looked like that, everyone's questions were resolved. So before I had even began my presentation, I had this huge air of mystery, drama. And so when I started speaking, people were already waiting for me to explain. They wanted more. So we talk about wanting the audience to want more and more and more. Right off the bat, the audience already wants to know what's going on with this slide. How does this relate to anything? So what is she going to say that explains why this slide actually looks like that? So when you're preparing your presentation, think about your slide. It's going to be the first impression. So let's start looking at the speech itself. So what was the hook of the speech? Well, I started off by saying your mother, your grandmother, your aunt, a friend, or maybe even you. We all know someone that has been affected by breast cancer. So I start off with a sincere welcome. I don't know if you noticed, but right at the beginning, I actually had my hands open in like a hug, come join me, let's start chatting type of gesture. And then I go on to mention people that are really important to you. I wanna start connecting with my audience right away. So I say your mother, your grandmother, I talk about your loved ones, let's connect on that level. Think about your loved ones as you're listening to my presentation. I also start off the presentation with dramatic fragments. Your mother, long pause. Your grandmother, long pause. I'm inviting the audience to actually think about it. I'm saying your mother, and then you have time to think about your mother. So utilize those pauses because it allows you time to breathe, and it also allows your audience time to think about what you were saying. At the end, I say, we all know somebody that has been affected by breast cancer. So I wanna do something dramatic, but also make it personal. We all know somebody, let's talk about it. So that sentence there is what we'll like to call the inciting incident. Something has happened, how are you going to develop this story? 
So the inciting incident is that someone that we know has breast cancer. What are we going to do about it? Well, let's talk about it. So now let's create some drama. So I start by saying, well, what you might not know is how hard it is to locate a cancerous tumor exactly. I go on by saying, with imaging technology, we can find out where the cancer is, and I point to the screen, and also where the cancer is not. So remember, my slide is the gradient from white to black. So I'm using an analogy where the black color is where the cancer is, and the white color is where the cancer is not. So during my presentation, I'm starting to answer those questions that people have been waiting for when they saw my slide. What exactly is going on? So this gradient is an analogy for the uncertainty of where the cancer is actually located. If you're going to gesture to your slide, make sure you do it in a meaningful way. So for example, I say, with imaging technology, we can find out where the cancer is, and I point, and I'm also looking. Because your audience is going to be listening to you, and if you just point, you're just pointing. You're just doing these gestures that you've rehearsed. It doesn't feel authentic. But if I point and I also look, then the audience goes, oh, I should probably look because she's looking there as well. It's important to do that. That's what she's doing. I guess I will do that too. So I point to the screen, I look, and I also pause. I pause because when I look, my face goes towards the screen. So anything that I say will not be projecting to the audience. So utilize your slide, gesture to it, look yourself, and make sure you pause so that your text, your speech, is continuous. So let's move on. I go for the rest of the speech. With imaging technology, we can find out where the cancer is, where the cancer is not. But what's really hard is to find that boundary, and I gesture to the gray area in the middle, where the healthy tissue and cancerous tissue transition. So this section is where I use my slide as an analogy of the problem that I want to resolve. And I emphasize that by using different movements and gestures, pointing, looking, pausing, using all of that together. Next, I want to develop the story a little bit more. So I start by saying, where does cancer begin? If this is the analogy, that gray area, we don't know where that boundary is, where does cancer begin? This is a technique that we've actually already used in this presentation where I echo the title. If you want to be memorable, use a little bit of repetition. Oh, I've heard that before. I kind of remember that. So I'm repeating my slide presentation title just to be a little bit more memorable. So that at the end, one of the takeaways is, what did Erica talk about in her three-minute thesis? Oh, well, she was talking about where does cancer begin, and that means boundary, blah, 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 blah. They can follow that just by remembering that little phrase. So where does cancer begin? Is it here? Is it there? Is it there? And I create more drama. It's just like really emphasizing this uncertainty. I point to so many different areas of the slide. I gesture this I don't know. I really build up the drama, and it's believable drama because if I were to say, where does it exactly transition from white to black on that slide, you probably don't know either because it's not such a harsh boundary. So emphasize that type of drama, emphasize the plausibility as well. Does this actually make sense? I act it out the entire time, and then I say, this is a real challenge. Surgeons face this every single day. In fact, many breast cancer patients that have their tumor surgically, tumors surgically removed have to come back a second time to get what was missed the first time. I'm using gestures throughout the entire time as well. Meaningful ones, they're not just, I'm a robot dancing. They all make sense and match the speech that I am saying. This paragraph where I start explaining what I want to do is also free of jargon. So, so far I haven't said a single technical word. Spoiler alert, I'm not going to say a single technical word. Then I want to state this huge problem. The peak of the drama is, how can we prevent this? I create this uncertain goal, then I can introduce that I will try to resolve this. So then I want to introduce myself. So I gesture and say, my name is Erica Dow, and I say it very clearly. My name is Erica Dow, I'm a PhD student, and 
My project involves developing a tool that surgeons can use right in the operating room to detect breast cancer. So I've introduced myself as well as my objective. And again, I'm using that repetition. How many times have you heard me talk about breast cancer and trying to detect breast cancer? At least three or four times. So I continue on. I study how breast tissue behaves when it's stimulated with optical light and x-rays. I look for trends and parameters such as how long do the tissues emit light after being illuminated? Or how does the light disperse in different directions? And what are the tissues made of at an elemental level? I use these parameters to create an algorithm for tissue classification. So that was a big paragraph. And that actually explains a very technical concept. The actual concept is called Time Resolved Fluorescence Diffuse Reflectance Optical Spectroscopy. And I, when I was trying to write my three minute thesis, I'm thinking, how do I explain time resolved fluorescence diffuse reflectance optical spectroscopy without using a single one of those words? So if you're trying to write your speech and you do something that has a very technical name and you're thinking, how do I explain this concept? Just don't even use those words. Just explain the concept itself. So you don't have to use the word. If you do EEGs, you don't even have to say EEG. Explain their electrical pulses or something. I don't know much about EEGs, to be honest. But just explain the concepts. You don't actually have to say the jargon itself. Feel free to just use completely non-technical words. Something that's kind of funny, and I don't know if you noticed in the presentation, is I said optical light, which lean slightly towards something more technical. So I wanted to make an analogy to something that everyone knows. So I was like, OK, I'll point to a light bulb. You know, Everyone knows optical light. Everyone's used a light bulb. So I actually point up to a light bulb. In the moment, I actually was blinded by the light. I just didn't understand or I didn't remember that lights are very bright. So I looked up at the light, and I was blinded. But because I was in the moment and thinking about what I was doing, I was able to just jump right back in and keep going. So I don't know I just, if you noticed, but I kind of just laughed it off. I kept going on the speech. I've seen other presentations where someone skips a word, or they skip a line, or something happens, and then they just walk off the stage. Uh, that has happened in presentations before. But if you're in the moment and you're able to adapt, just laugh it off, keep going, and you can still finish your presentation. And some people might not even notice that that had happened at all. Again, the whole technical speech was filled with analogies, explaining the concepts without jargon. And I used gestures the whole time. If I'm talking about light being reflected, I'm going like this, different directions, moving my hands, moving my head to look at the different directions as well, making sure that they're meaningful and authentic. So that big section explaining the really technical part, after that, I kind of wanted to give the audience a break. You've listened to this big paragraph filled with technical concepts. So let's end that act, end of act one, and let's move on. Let's go back to some bigger picture ideas. So I end act one, and I want to start the new act. And I actually do that by physically moving. So I was standing here talking about that. And then when I start this new section, I actually move to a different area of the stage. Just subliminally with my body language, I'm telling the audience, if that was too much to handle, let's just move on. <laughs> let's just go somewhere else and talk about something else as well. So I start the new section by actually talking about the device itself. So how does the device work? Well, it's going to be used when it absolutely matters most, during surgery. Again, really emphasizing certain words. This was another spot where I messed up in my presentation. Obviously, my presentation was not perfect. I said, when it absolutely matters, most. But again, I just said most, and I continued on. Funny story, after this presentation, I actually sent the YouTube link to my brother, who has no scientific background at all, because I wanted to hear what did he think about my presentation. Maybe now he'll understand what I do in my physics lab in the basement of GSB. And all he responded back was, Merced, LOL. 
And I was like, oh, okay, that's what you really remember. But afterwards, he was like, okay, that actually was just a, a tiny part of your presentation. Overall, it was still pretty good. So if you recover well enough by the end, people will just forget that you even made that mistake. So I'm hoping that by the end you forgot that I said MERST. Um, embarrassing. It'll haunt me forever. I'm just kidding. Just move on if you've made a mistake. People will forget, especially in the competition. There's a whole bunch of other competitors. Be memorable in a good way. So the good outweighs any possible little mistakes or stumbles that you make along the way. So let's move the action forward. Let's keep the story going. A surgeon will place this pen-like probe right on top of the tissue. Again, if you're describing something, relate that to what people know. Pen-like probe, we've all written with, with a pen, so it's just like a pen. Put it right on top of the tissue. It will emit light and also emit light that is emitted or reflected. So again, use your gestures in a meaningful way so that people understand how this is supposed to work. Within seconds, it will report either cancerous, remove the tissue, or non-cancerous, leave it in place. With that snap, I'm showing that I'm confident. Look how quickly it happens. Snap, snap, super easy. Show that you're confident because it makes you more believable. Have you ever listened to someone say something like, um, kind of, maybe, sure, kind of, and then you're like, I don't think they actually know what they talk about. I'm gonna go and Google that thing that they just said. If you sound like you're confident, people are going to believe you more. I continue the story, and I also say, this is what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to predict the outcome of my project, and I illustrate that with different gestures. Again, <coughs> let's talk about something. Let's change directions, I walk backwards a little bit. This device will help surgeons navigate that gray area. So now I'm showing, people might have been like, okay, this presentation, how long has this been? Let's try to close things. So I'm gonna walk backwards to where it started, and then go back, to the slide. Remember my slide was white to black gradient. So let's talk about that gray area. And then I point and look to the center of the screen. So I say, this device will help surgeons navigate that gray area so that they know exactly how much tissue to remove. Not too little and risk leaving cancer still in the body, making a gesture everyone understands. And also not too much and unnecessarily removing completely healthy tissue. Again, a lot of repetition, we've heard this before. Breast cancer, boundary detection, is this cancer, is this not cancer? And I make it very personal, you know, I'm pointing to myself, I have a body, I wanna be able to detect cancer, you have a body, let's try to detect cancer. Make it personal all throughout. My goal is that within the next few years, we will have the technology to keep my loved ones and your loved ones as whole as possible really making it personal, making it relatable, you know? I'm saying my loved ones and your loved ones as well. You have people you can think about and I have people I can think about as well. We have that connection. And when I say that, my loved ones and your loved ones, that's echoing the beginning. I started off by stating your loved ones, your mother, your grandmother, your aunt, a friend. So it's just tying this circle together so that you can really think about Oh, okay, now that everything's tied back to the beginning, maybe the story is coming to a close, I'm satisfied. So I keep my loved ones and your loved ones as whole as possible. I say thank you, slight bow, and so you can signal to everyone that you're done. And that was my three minute thesis in a nutshell. Now you're probably thinking, whoa, that was a lot. Did you really think about every single one of those things? And truthfully, no, I did not. A lot of this came afterwards when we were dissecting the speech with John. And that's okay. You don't have to really outline every single gesture you're going to make, every single step that you're going to make, every little thing that you do because it might come to you naturally. And when it comes to you naturally, it comes off a lot more authentic. So I did think about some of the gestures, some of the pauses, structure for sure, but in the moment, because I was there looking at people, if I'm saying you and I'm looking at you and I gesture to you, that's happening, it's real, it's authentic. I'm not just going you and you, let's, aren't you, am I, aren't I being relatable? Because I say you and I'm just pointing out into the audience. Make it really authentic. Do we have any questions about anything I've talked about? Yeah. Yeah, that's a great question. So the question was if, like, 
I said a lot of the times, make it personal. <laughs> and admittedly, my project is easy to do that. When it's healthcare and everyone has health, it's easy to connect with people on that level. If you're doing something a lot more technical, maybe you're doing something like an algorithm for something complex for a certain application, stress the application. Right, or if it's or if it's theoretical. Yeah. So the idea is that the question you always want to answer is why should anyone care? And the way you get people to care is to say, hey, this could be useful to you. So even if it's theoretical, think about how you could make it personal. Maybe right now there's no application, but if your work comes out with a certain outcome, maybe that has an application. So think about it in a, in a broad sense as well. We have a comment from Julian here. Uh, yeah, so the person who won first place last year was actually in image engineering. Yeah, repeat. The yeah, so um, the person who came last year in first place was uh, Matthew Compea, right? Yeah, Matthew Compea. Uh, and um, he's in engineering. So you might grab some inspiration from that. Um, and his three minute thesis is available on YouTube on the SGS, the YouTube. Or you can try to make an analogy related to it, which is exactly what Matthew did. Um, so he was talking about just using sugars, and he just was like, oh, you know what? Sugars, carbs. You know what's carbs? Sandwich. His slide was a sandwich. Everyone knows what a sandwich is. So just use an analogy to make it something people understand as well. So that's definitely a great technique. Yeah, we, we'll address this question of uh, a little more with some of the slides that I'll show a little later. That's great. It'll give her a, a round of applause. That was fantastic. <laughs> That was great. Thanks, th Eric. Thank you. Thanks so much. So, Michelle, it's over to you. Uh, there's a question. Oh, there's not the question. Oh, okay. Go ahead. I'm wondering, what did you struggle with while you were creating your three-minute thesis, and how did you overcome that? Yeah, so the question was, what was my biggest struggle? Um, my biggest struggle was the slide, because I wanted to just make it like this huge wow factor. And another huge struggle was trying to make technical work non-technical. So I had thought of so many ways. I'm like, maybe I should introduce an acronym for time resolved fluorescence, diffuse reflectance, optical spectroscopy. So like, okay, maybe if I introduce an acronym, I can just say that instead. Um, maybe should I go into more detail about the technical aspect? Like I talk about elemental composition. Should I talk about how I'm looking specifically for iron and zinc and calcium? Like, that was a struggle as well, but I really just thought, okay, if I was just talking to the grocery store clerk and they were like, hey, cool t-shirt, are you a grad student, what do you do? How would they want to listen to it? And the answer is, they don't care about the technical jargon, so I said, I'm just not gonna say it. I'll explain the concept so you know what's going on, but I'll just skip that. So I think one of the toughest things was moving away from jargon, but just really step back and think about who would know this word and if they would even care. Another great way to combat that problem was I did practice a lot on people who had no scientific background, like my mom. Uh, no scientific background, I gave the presentation to her the first time and she was like, oh, okay, that actually makes a little bit of sense. And I was like, cool, I'll keep improving, but that's a good place to start as well. Okay, we, we can come back, to, we'll, we'll come back to some of these questions. We should move along a little bit now to Michelle, and uh, I'll get your one minute presentation. I'll do it. All right. I'll do it. Hi, I'm Michelle Ogrodnik, and I'm a mind wanderer. Come on, we've all been there, trying to focus on a presentation, but instead thinking about that oh so delicious donut you're gonna eat next. In fact, university students can spend almost half their time off task. But our research shows that short exercise breaks during learning can dramatically reduce mind wandering compared to computer game breaks or no breaks. Importantly, those who completed exercise breaks in the study immediately had higher quiz scores right after learning and two days later. On McMaster's grading scale, this might be the difference between a B and an A. So with the goal of creating refined, feasible exercise prescriptions for students and teachers, one thing seems certain. Students need to sweat so they don't forget. Thank you. Yeah, so 
the plan is not to do that live again, but the goal of showing you this is so you watched my five minute video and about the same story. And I think this was like 54 seconds or something like that. And so the three minutes that you have is hard, but it's not impossible. And I really loved your question about what was challenging. And to go back actually to even this one minute pitch, something that I find really, really hard is in these short, amount, short amounts of time, I'm normally someone who just, again, like I said, speaks off the cuff, kind of blabbers along. And so having to script something and say it in a way that didn't feel really forced was really challenging for me. And so when I was figuring out this one minute shenanigans, um, one of the things that I would do is I would say it in different ways. Um, so it came off despite saying the same thing in the same script. I like figured out how to like be goofy with it. I would like whisper it sometimes, or I would like, like say it in different accents. I would just, I was in a weird state. However, I found that being able to say the same thing in different contexts allowed me to be much more natural with it, where it didn't feel like I had to say the same thing and have the same inflection at the exact same time. Like I, I felt more real. And that's one of the things here. I was, it was when we were giving a workshop, so it was kind of off the cuff, but I would encourage you as you're being critical with your script, if that's something you struggle with, say it in different ways to different people and practice not using the same everything all the time, because that's when it starts to feel robotic. Cool. Feeling good. We're okay. 614. We're still following, still doing all right. Okay. John. Thanks, Michelle. Okay, static, single static slides, keep them sim simple. I think we've already seen a, a particularly simple slide. Um, one of the things I worried about was how black was the black area. Remember, we, we, made, we beefed up the black a little bit. Yeah, the gray was too big. We, we, we just worked on the gradient there. Develop your slide first. You know, develop two or three or four slides. Develop them and, uh, you know, he, here's an example from my own department uh, where a three-minute thesis is now mandatory for all graduate students. Uh, are we drinking pharmaceuticals? That, that looks like a very simple, straightforward. I, it tells a story. That entire slide tells a story. Uh, one of the things that I haven't mentioned is if you use the, the saying that a picture is worth a thousand words, then in three minutes, that picture is beaming a thousand words at the audience while you are delivering 360 words, for example. So your slide is competing with you. And if it's a very busy, difficult to understand slide, difficult to engage with, you, you, you're constantly distracted trying to figure out what that slide's all about. Here's another simple slide. Sniffing out weapons with microwaves from, again, my department. Um, here is a, a winning presentation by Daniel Tajik. Uh, he won um, audience choice as well as the judges first place choice in Honolulu in 2017 with this. Uh, you can find it on, on, on YouTube, just search for it, you can find it there. And there's a blueberry here and there's a story behind the blueberry. Why didn't you tell the story behind the blueberry, the Michelle? Like not feeling great, but then also oh. keep standing. Um, for so before I met Daniel, so I had done the 3MT the year before, and so John was like, hey, come listen to this guy give his pitch. It's pretty good. You should come check it out and give some feedback. Again, speaking to this, like, practicing in front of new people. And I don't know why Daniel's name didn't stick for me, but I remembered him as the blueberry guy for forever. I can still, when I think about Daniel, the first thing I think about is being the blueberry guy. And he did such a great job, John will show, of like really bringing that all together. He wore a blue tie. The blueberry was so interesting because he's talking about like microwaves. It was, it was such an interesting piece. And so um, part of being memorable, I think, is engaging in a way where you kind of think outside the box. Um, and your name might not be the only thing that sticks, but knowing the blueberry guy, like I wouldn't have forgotten his presentation. So there's a little bit of nuance to that too. And now that we've whetted your appetite about what on earth is a blueberry doing in a microwave imaging uh, piece of research, go and take a look at the, uh, at, at the video. And again, this is from my department, Brainwave Analysis for Stroke Detection. You will find an analysis of this presentation in last year's workshop 
that we did, which is on my YouTube channel. You'll see a detailed presentation very much like what uh, uh, Erica just did, but it was, the analysis was done by, uh, by Daniel Tajik himself. There, there's Erica's uh, slides. I just repeat that there to give you that idea of simplicity, to come back to that. 3MT titles, catchy but meaningful. So you need a title. Again, think of a title early on as well, because you know you can. You, the title may sometimes inform what you actually write in the uh, in your text. So here's one: sweat so you don't forget. Lead poisoning is everywhere. Sniffing out weapons with microwaves. Are we drinking sign? Uh, are we drinking pharmaceuticals? Scientifically quantifying the craft of acting. Matthew Berry his winning presentation both at McMaster University as well as in Ontario, which is an amazing, amazing thing. A totally unique, absolutely unique. Now that's, uh, well, we could have analyzed this, but that's so unique and so, I don't know, special that I think, you know, it would be a, a very hard act to follow. Very hard act to follow. So here's some, here's some more catchy titles. Fighting obesity with fat, and Julian is right there. He'll talk about that shortly. Breast cancer, the racial divide. We have Sean Hercules back there in the audience, so we have some great guests coming up shortly. And this was already mentioned earlier, Matthew Campier, the sweet spot. And again, the sweet spot, the, 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 the sweet spot has a meaning. That phrase has a meaning, look it up. It's not just three, that's not just two words. A tarantula's view of the wireless 5G power web around us. Okay, wow. Shaping our electronic future with liquid metal, etc., etc. Okay, at this particular point, what I'd like to do is let's start with Matthew Berry. Matthew, come up. We're going to have some recollections, experiences, and comments. Whatever you want to say. Yep, go ahead and hold, hold it close. Yep. yep, can do. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Matthew Berry. I am a PhD student in the Neuro Arts Lab here at McMaster University. And in 2017, I did 3MT for the first time, and I was able to get fourth place, which was really exciting for me. But I knew that wasn't where I wanted to leave it. And so I tried it again in 2018 and ended up becoming the McMaster 3MT champion and then going on to become the uh, 2018 Ontario 3MT champion champion, which was really, really cool. And my dad was there and he was like such a proud papa and he was just sort of like, that's my boy. And I thought that was just delightful. Um, my recollections of that entire experience was uh, a lot of fun. And this is a fun experience that you guys can, that you guys are going to be doing, I do hope. Um, but also it is in a really, really engaging and learning opportunity, a big learning opportunity for you guys, just to see how well do you know your own research to the point that you're able to summarize it to the degree that you are going to be summarizing it to. Um, I found out that there were a lot of, not holes, but certainly there were aspects of my research that I hadn't considered before because I needed to take all the information that I had collected and pick an inf a point, a nugget of truth or a really, really good point to present to my audience. And so you're going to be scouring all the stuff that you're going to be, that you have already research um, up to this point, and then you're going to say, okay, what is worth uh, explaining more? What is worth going in, in depth in the three minutes that you have uh, to be able to do that? So you're going to find out a lot about yourself and a lot about the research that you're, that you're doing. Um, the one comment that I would mainly like to stress for you guys is have fun with it. This whole experience is great. You get to learn about your research. Uh, you might win some money. Um, but you might not. And so the whole thing that you should be doing is th this is your time that you are spending. Make it worth your time by having it be a non-stressful experience or at least reduce the amount of stress by picking things and playing and having fun with it. If you look up my Ontario 3MT uh, video, I do some really ridiculous stuff partly because my research allows me to do it. I study acting, I am an actor, and partly because I just wanted to have fun and be goofy. So I do dad jokes and I do weird, weird like performance stuff while I'm doing my presentation. So 
I want you guys to find like the fun little piece inside of the research that you're doing, the part that you like the most and just enjoy it and expand it out and try and project that fun into your audience and see how much they can engage with that. And that's going to increase the authenticity that was talked about earlier and just make your experience so much more enjoyable. So even if you don't win the money, you still had a good time, but hopefully you win the money. Um, I'd be more than happy to answer any questions if you guys have any questions for me, um, either now or after the talk, but uh, yeah. yeah. Absolutely, let me ask you some questions. Oh, well, ahead, well, one of the things that makes his unique is he's doing the science of acting, and he's an actor and a scientist. So that means he can use the stage uh, in a way similar to the way Eric had indicated. He could move from place to place on the stage, maybe on one side of the stage you might be the actor, on the other side of the stage you might be the scientist. So if you look at the, the uh, positioning of those talking heads on TV and which is the powerful position, I would maintain, I don't know, contradict me, but I would maintain that if you're on stage right, you're the scientist, stage left, you're the actor. Does that make any sense to you? I think like it, originally when I did the talk the first time, uh, that was what we had established, was that um, uh, part of uh, the gimmick uh, that I was using at that first talk um, in 2017 was I would give um, acting advice on one side and I would explain uh, the performance in the scientific part on the other side. Um, the way that I restructured, because I used it as a learning opportunity, um, the way that I restructured the talk for the 2018 uh, presentation was actually to treat it more like, um, okay, I'm in the center stage. So I was, I was actually, I came in from off stage, smiling the entire time, and I found my point center stage. And you know, I'm kind of doing like a voice right now, and that was supposed to be like the hi, how you, how are you doing? This is my sort of presenter voice. And then at a particular point. Uh, partway through the presentation, I actually uh, got to explore the, not that you get to see my slide or anything, but I got to present my data because my data is acted data, I could actually act out my data. And so I did that by using the space that I had around me. So I altered my voice and my gestures and I stepped back and became a particular character. And then I stepped forward and became a different character. And then I stepped to the side and became a different Er character, and then I stepped to the other side and became a fourth and final character before becoming myself again and explaining the data um, in a more scientific way. So, like, it was unique in this particular point um, with my data, but the, the point that I want to give to you guys is to think about the way that you are presenting your own information and to use the sort of idiom of your own data or your own personality and you can use your space, your gestures, your voice, and just, going back to my earlier point, play and have fun and come up with crazy ideas as to how to present your information in unique ways because we've all seen TED Talks and they all look the same and that's fine because you know it's a systematic way of presenting information. But a more exciting way is just around the corner and I want you guys to find it because great presentations are made that way. Th thanks, Matthew. Yeah, okay, thanks, Matthew. Thank you. Sean, you want to come next? Do you be <clears throat> Sean Hercules. And you've also done it twice, right? You've, you've all done it twice. Are you doing it again? Uh, we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> You'll see. Aha, uh -huh. okay. <laughs> Go ahead. Good evening, everyone. I'm Sean Hercules. Um, I actually did the 3MT three times. The first time I didn't place, I forgot my speech and I kind of <coughs> froze and I walked off, basically. Um, so that was the first time in 2017, the year that Matt won. And then I did it again in 2018. Oh, also the first time I just put together a speech and my lab helped me, yay. But I didn't have a coach, a great coach like John here. So um, I worked with John in 2018, uh, the following year, and it went pretty well. I came third that year, so yay. <laughs> um, and then last year I did it again and also made it to the finals. Um, but 3MT was a really, really great experience for me. Um, before doing the 3MT, I did a bit of like communications work, 
But the three MT really uh, solidified um, communicating science in a very easy and accessible kind of way. Like not to dumb down science, but to really explain it in a way that is easily um, digestible in a sense. And since the three MT, I've just been loving communication, uh, communicating science more specifically. Um, my advice would be to, as Matt said, just have fun. Just go with it, have fun. Don't be too strict with your script. Um, uh, John, I don't, he probably would have said it before, but um, along the lines of not trying to memorize the lines of the script, but memorizing the, not memorizing at all, but just knowing the concepts of what you're talking about so you don't have to feel as though this word comes after this word. Like it's not like a formula. You just have to go with it and have fun with it. And that's how um, the best 3MTs I've seen, like Matt's 3MT, Erica's, Michelle's, Julian's, um, all great three minute theses because they were not so defined by the script because they knew the script like the back of their hands so they can have fun with the script um, in a sense. Um, and that's basically all I can really say about it. Yeah. Any, any, any questions? Yeah, there's a question there. What can go wrong? Uh, Michelle said everything, <laughs> or someone said yeah, anything and everything. So the year I came third, actually, I forgot a part of my script. Um, but because, as I was just saying, like knowing it like the back of your hand and knowing your research, I so like so say I I like my speech was A to B to C. I did A to C, forgot B, and then had to like switch around B after C. And the script actually flowed a lot better that way in retrospect, because I came third, <laughs> right? Um, so yeah, just uh, anything and everything could go wrong. Um, just try to be comfortable, as I said, with the script, and don't, like, don't be too strict about the script. Because as Erica said earlier, we've seen people start their 3MT and then walk off because they feel defeated because they forgot their script. Um, nothing else really goes wrong like there's no random like light <laughs> or anything that happens throughout it well unless you stare at the ceiling um i can't think of anything that goes awfully wrong apart from not being comfortable with the script yeah thanks thanks what, what's yeah. that you, you, the butterflies that you have right the butterflies blacking out yeah <laughs> yeah, a lot of things to worry. Thank, thanks, uh, Sean. I appreciate that. Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, Julian. Yeah, good. Julian Yabbit. Hi, everybody. Uh, it's great to see everyone out here. Everyone's interested in 3MT. Uh, it's really good, especially with you know how much it's kind of meant to me with uh, with doing the, with uh, the competition. So uh, similar to both uh, Matt and uh, Sean, I've done 3MT for two years. Uh, so the first year, I kind of went in. I was just like, oh, I, I you know, I'm just gonna see what happens. Try and memorize something in three minutes, um, and then I got to the finals, um, and then didn't get, I didn't place or anything like that, which was okay. Um, and I learned from a lot of the feedback and then I started, what I started doing afterwards is when uh, SGS finally published those presentations uh, and taking a look at like differences between what did I do and what did other people do. So you can see with, with Erica's um, uh, presentation, for instance, uh, hers was very simple, but I remember what I did in my first year was that I was super complex. It was like stuff flying all over the place, like telling you to look over here, then look over there and not like having a particular place to kind of, um, kind of stand, like little things like that, and just analyzing and seeing what those differences were, um, that definitely helped a lot. So I kind of had a general idea of, you know, how is I gonna construct the, the script? Now, if you wanna get even more serious with it, I would definitely encourage you to talk to this man right here, who is probably the 3MT specialist, um, and that's exactly what I did. And in uh, last year, so 2019, yeah, 2019, wow, that was, Long time ago. Uh, in 2019, I, I was able to get third place. Uh, so behind Erica, uh, that was, which was really awesome. Um, but other than that, I think in terms of uh, my own recommendations, one was to practice with a clock in front of you. 
because what you'll find is that you, you have this monitor that's kind of like you know center stage right in front of you and it's it, it gets pretty daunting sometimes so me having a like my own cell phone that just kind of has you know the the clock winding down and kind of figuring that out that timing out that was definitely something helpful so that when you do look at a big screen that it kind of tells you you have 10 seconds left and you have 10 words left to go that you don't jumble towards the end because you know as someone here said they said oh yeah like one of the most impactful things erica said in hers was within those last 10 seconds right so um you want to leave that sort of uh, impact um another thing too is is i currently do like consulting for charitable organizations and you have to memorize like these pitches so, right so what was really interesting for this aspect is i used a lot of the things that i used to memorize my 3mt uh and one of the biggest ones and especially whoever talked about um distractions or things that might go wrong within the presentation is to do it while you're doing like random things so it might sound so funny, but I was doing in the shower while I was doing my business in, in, in the shower, right? But you're focusing on doing other motions and other things, but other things you'll be looking at or something like that. And even though, you know, someone might get up from their seat or um, someone might be, you know, playing with their phone and then light pops up or something like that distracts you, that those kinds of things, they don't really you know, affect you in the grand scheme of things, right? Because I feel that when you're less confident about your script, um, when you're in an isolated environment where you might be staring at a wall or something like that, um, those are, you, you need those distractions to kind of help you focus even when things like that go awry. Um, that would be another piece of information. Um, I don't know, oh, also, in just a high level doing this entire competition, it definitely teaches you about knowledge translation, which I feel is important with regards to any work you might be doing after your PhD. So for me, for instance, my defense data set, I'm graduating with a PhD in March, um, but then this you know, aspect of uh, knowledge translation is super important with whatever you end up doing. So when you're doing a presentation to you know, experts in the field, for me, I do obesity and type two diabetes research, Obviously, they're going to understand my jargon, like inhibiting mast cell serotonin synthesis inhibits the browning of white adipose tissue. But for you guys, it means absolutely nothing. What I can also say is we have a white blood cell that can reduce the amount of um, calories that our fat can expend. Right. So that's something more digestible. Um, but that's really the whole sort of challenge of the three minute thesis is being able to go out into a, an audience of 100 people or whatever it may be, even people that might watch you on YouTube one day if you make the finals or if you have your stuff kind of um, what do you call it, uh, like recorded and put on SGS or something like that. But at the end of the day, like at the like high level, what sort of skill you get from this is that aspect of knowledge translation, because when you go out into the world and you become you know, the future, I don't know, engineers or, doc or doctors or, you know, researchers or whatever, and you want to be able to kind of convey your research or the things that matter to you in your own job, that you're going to have to be able to, you know, take these really hard um, or non-digestible sort of words and then making them into something that, you know, per someone in, in grade 10 can understand, right? And that's what I like to say to a lot of my students as well. So I, I'm also a sessional instructor in the, the Bachelor of Health Sciences program. And I tell them, yeah, like, you know, if you, if they're really Really, um, complex concepts just kind of di like kind of break it down into digestible parts that you know someone at uh, you know a grade 10 level could probably explain because um, for usually grade 10 is the last time we take science in Canada mandatorily like you don't have to take it in grade 11 or grade 12 or anything like that at least from when I was in science 10 years ago or 12 years ago um, but yeah so I don't know if is that was that too much or we're good okay sounds good any questions for Julian? I have a question. So um, last year in the final, I remember Julian went second and I went, oh my gosh, how am I supposed to compete with that guy? I was so blown away at how good your presentation was. And obviously I wasn't the only one you want competitor's choice. But the reason that you stood out so much more than everyone else was that you felt the most authentic. When I was sitting in the audience, it actually just felt like we were just chatting. Like you, like I ran into you in a cafe and I was like, hey, what do you do? And you explained what you, you did. And you did it in such an authentic way. What are your tips on how to just sound conversationalist, but intentional at the same time? 
Yeah, so it's funny you say that because um, that was kind of my whole overarching thing is that, you know, if um, someone asked me about my research, like this is kind of the same tone that I'll have when, you know, trying to be like telling them, oh, yeah, this is my advice. I would tell you this and that, you know, obesity is this or, you know, how do you get type 2 diabetes? How is that actually happening? But um, I think the passion sometimes resonates through. Um, because what a lot of my friends like in the lab, but also my own friends that I have, they're like, you're very intense sometimes, especially when you like want to teach us something about, you know, your research or, you know, the challenge of me being able to, you know, like when I was talking about, you know, the white blood cells and like energy expenditure of fat tissue, like trying to do that and like telling my buddies who are all in business. So all my buddies are either consultants or in sales for like different businesses and whatnot. So it's always interesting to kind of do that. But uh, yeah, definitely the passion, um, definitely having that conversational sort of mood, like you're talking to a friend um, is definitely something good too. Um, but at the same time, I did have a little bit of a cheat code. I did drama all throughout high school. So grades nine to 12, um, and then a little bit of that kind of doesn't help. I mean, uh, sorry, uh, that doesn't hurt to have, um, but also being super comfortable in front of crowds might also be, might play a role in that too. Um, and not focusing on anyone's like face, don't do that. Uh, I think that's like one of the, the biggest tidbits there for sure. Um, but other than that, I don't know, it, it might just be. Charisma. Luck. <laughs> <laughs> We've talked a lot and John has mentioned a lot there's a whole bunch of resources. So you can watch competitors from the McMaster competition in previous years. Like you can watch all of our presentations online. You can watch presentations from presenters from other institutions all throughout the world. Watch a lot of them and figure out what traits from each one worked. Like what did you like about that presentation and try to incorporate that into yours. So you saw an example of my presentation, which was very dramatic and very serious. I would highly recommend watching Julian's, which like I was laughing as you were giving your presentation as well. So you can kind of decide how you want to do your presentation, whether you want to do something more serious, do something a little bit more funny, watch a whole bunch of them and figure out what works with how you present and what type of tone you want to send in your presentation. So thank you very much. And best of luck, best of luck, everybody. And go ahead and register. Register, register, and good luck. Okay, thank you so much.